John Boy. John. Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trash, we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you from them with lessons So sit back as we groove, giving you the review So you only spend time on the docs that you need to Welcome to another episode of Lessons from the Screen The show where we give you a review of whether or not any particular show that you can get through any particular screen of any particular kind is worth your time. We waste our time, our energy, and our brain power so that you don't have to. You're welcome. Lessons from the Screen is sponsored by PacSync, a black activist, advocacy, and think tank with the purpose of increasing the quality of life for black people in America through education, a culture shift, and economics. Check them out at P-A-C-T-S-I-N-C dot O-R-G That's PacSync dot org Drop a line Drop a donation Become a member Volunteer Get involved In 1849 A book was published In a niche but growing genre That would become one of the most powerful sections Of American literature And the most damning For American historical pride That genre was dubbed Slave narratives not only did these books serve to vilify a major force in american culture and a major source of american wealth but they also pushed back heavily on american propaganda which sought to convey an image of pride and dignity with regards to the owning of human beings and after more than 150 years these books are still serving the same purpose as America continues to resist accepting its cultural legacy and continues to push propaganda that promotes the pride and dignity of the darkest sections of American history. Today, on Lessons from the Screen, we will be taking a look at the narrative of Henry Bibb, an American slave. The book was written in 1849 by Henry Bibb himself and reveals a lot about slavery in America in addition to the overall American culture at that time that would accept such an institution. We will give a brief review of the book, interesting points about it. We will also give one of the biggest takeaways for us from the reading of the book. This is definitely a book you should read, and it's one that you can find for free, as a matter of fact. And the link will be provided in this post for this show on the Freedom Train website, www.freedomtrainradio.com. In this episode of Lessons from the Screen, we will be looking at the narrative of Henry Bibb. The narrative of Henry Bibb is about Henry Bibb and his quest for freedom, not just for himself, but for his wife and child. And that pretty much sums up the entirety of the book. Now, even though it can be summed up in one sentence, as most slave narratives can, what makes all slave narratives interesting is the fact that they ha all have to overcome a specific set of challenges and a common set of challenges. But it's the specific set of challenges that are often most interesting and most compelling, as well as the general pictures that they paint and the specific pictures that they paint of the American South or wherever they were slaves because there were slaves in the American North and in the American West, as well as the culture and the society and the social norms on their particular plantations and the slaves that they themselves interacted with as well as the free blacks. And so this book falls in that genre. And honestly, I think all of them are interesting narratives, but this book is one that I think stands out to me anyways, particularly, well, for multiple reasons, but one of the most particular of them was that the level of scrutiny that the book underwent before it was published 
it's something that I haven't seen very often in the in the case of slave narratives and the fact that most of that information was published as a piece of the book where people were writing letters to some of the names and figures mentioned in the book to see if Henry Bibb had actually been there, if he had actually done the things that he had done and things of that nature. And for the most part, from what is published in the book, as well as what you could find off, not in the book, but just in, gen in the general course of history and other documentations and such, this book is extremely accurate. It is an extremely accurate narrative of what goes on, which makes the points that are made in the book that much stronger and makes the brutality in the book that much more horrific. Now, there are several interesting points. Virtually every chapter had a plethora of interesting points for me to research, to dig into, to, to think about. And of those, I'm going to highlight some of them that I found most memorable. And one of them was the point surrounding religion and superstition. Now, Henry Bibb says, especially in the early portion of the book, that most of the slaves weren't religious. They were superstitious. They practiced their own systems of spirituality, and they had their own way of believing that they could impact the world. And they weren't christian because they didn't believe that a god would be okay with them being in the position that they're in now this is what's interesting to me on several levels because we constantly hear people talking about historians authors you name it constantly talking about how christianity was kind of beat into us during slavery so to, and this isn't the only narrative that I've read that makes this claim. But here you have a book where he's saying, look, most of the slaves were heathens by Christian standards. They did not believe in the Christian God. They did not believe in the Christian doctrine. He even goes so far as to say that they use church time for church to free time on Sunday as a means to get up to their own devices and do what they wanted to do centered around entertaining themselves via various different forms of entertainment or entertaining their masters via, again, various different forms of entertainment. So that was interesting as well because there's this, this pushback in a lot of these narratives that says that, look, we weren't Christians. We weren't that, we weren't that naive or that, uh, 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 we weren't that gullible to believe that, the God that you worship that has given you dominion over us would also be a God that cares about us. And that's an interesting point on several different levels. Now, we could go real deep into this religious conversation and talk about Christianity and its origins in Africa and all this other stuff. But that would be kind of outside the scope of where I'm trying to go with this book. But I mentioned all of that just to say that all of that is available in terms of understanding the, our relationship with Christianity as black people in America, and especially in understanding their relationship as our ancestors and slaves in America with Christianity. So it's definitely something you should look up. Another point that was mentioned was his hesitation with marriage. And again, even more hesitation when it came to children. He was not happy being a slave. And he did not want to sire more slaves. He did not want to be responsible for the creation of more slaves. He saw it almost as a crime of humanity. And he did not want to get married because he did not want anything to distract him from his dreams of freedom. But lo and behold, humans are social creatures. The heart wants what the heart wants. All of these different slogans say the same thing. So even in that, he professed once he found someone that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with and that came with a whole slew of other challenges from her mother and what her mother wanted from her and the slave master and what the slave master wanted from from her and from him so that whole section was extremely interesting to read about and should definitely be read but 
he vowed once he found her that he would they would not get married he would not marry any woman unless she was as agreeable to the nature of his discontent with being a slave and his desire for freedom so she had to be just as agreeable to those ideas as he was and he found a woman that was just as agreeable but then another interesting thing happens is exactly what he didn't want to happen he got married had a child and almost gave up on his quest for freedom because of his family and his desire to want to be with them and his understanding that it would be extremely difficult to get away with them so that was interesting in and of itself watching that dynamic play out and that's something that we don't see in a lot of slave narratives that dynamic of of the family of the slave and the strength of that bond uh so that was an interesting point of discussion another interesting point of discussion was the fact that the children and the spouses were often used as a form of punishment, as a form of deterrence, as a form of encouraging obedience. If you're not obedient to me, I will do this to your child. I will do this to your wife. I will sell your child. I will sell your wife. So that's something that's interesting. And that plays a large part in what we're seeing today as everybody is outraged with using the children of, of immigrants as a deterrent. For bringing them into the country and saying that that's not who we are in this narrative of henry bibb we see very clearly over 150 years ago that is most definitely who we are you know what i'm saying that is most definitely who we have been so and when i say we i'm a black male so i'm not talking about we as in me i'm talking about we as in those of us that are in america it is not something that we've been above especially not the dominant white society so that in and of itself is an interesting component in that it relates to what's happening right now. Also, once he did escape and there was a whole long path between what made him finally decide that I got to get the hell out of here. That was a whole lot of thing. But once he got out, he was trying to get back in to grab his wife and child and bring them back out with him so it wasn't like he escaped and then he was just off to his own devices no he escaped and he came back three times to get his wife and child very interesting to read about each time he came back and what ended up happening to him each time he came back so and even after he finally did get away again for the third time finally um, it was interesting to read about how he still had not given up on his wife and child and how he had sent people to see if they could find her. So that whole point was interesting in and of itself. And that that section alone, in my opinion, makes the book well worth the read. His means of escaping from the plantation was also interesting. I'll go ahead and reveal this. But the, one of the first times he is, he attempted to escape, he just walked right off the plantation. Like he literally just walked right off the plantation because he had made a decision or he, he had an understanding in his mind that if they, if they found him ducking and dodging through the woods and traveling along the river and all these other things, they would immediately know that he was a slave a runaway but if he walked on the main roads and acted like he had a pass he was more likely to be let go by anybody that came across him and so that shows a level of understanding and a level of intelligence that's rarely attributed to the slaves even in modern movies, there's this level of acquiescence or this level of, of acceptance. But in these narratives, we see that there isn't. There is a level of understanding, a level of planning, a level of cunning that's going on with them trying to get free, but also trying to get free in a manner in which, one, they don't cause their brethren that remain any harm. 
and two, that they escape and remain in such condition that they can enjoy their freedom. So it does no good to just run away and then get caught and then get brutalized, tortured, have your body parts ripped off or whatever the case might be. It does no good. And I know a lot of people will say, well, death before slavery, death before bondage and whatnot. And that's an easy thing to say when you're not facing bondage. Uh, but I'm not, well, you know what? I'm not even going to get into all of that because a lot of people won't even make the decision to say, uh, you know, my freedom and my people before my job and my bills. So they're, they're not even going to make that decision, much less make a decision about life or death, bondage and otherwise. Yeah, so th that is, in my opinion, anybody that makes that argument is not genuine. So moving forward, he also talked about learning to read and write in jail. And th this was interesting because we see this a lot, not, not just in slave narratives, but today when we talk about the prison system we talk about how it is a form of university a, a form of higher education for criminals and here you have it in in the 1830s 1840s you have a man who is learning how to do something illegal in prison so it, that was just an interesting thing to 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 see how that narrative of learning how to harness illegal skills and illegal trades in prison existed even back then and how you can see how prison has always kind of been this 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 university of sorts for illegal activity and 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 gaining illegal skills very very powerful in understanding that and we also get to understand that the well-meaning white folks, and this is really interesting, well-meaning white folks were not well-meaning enough to put themselves in real danger. And this is something that was shown at least two or three times in the book, where you had white people that were well-meaning, that did mean to do the right things. But when it came down to doing the right thing and keeping themselves out of harm, they almost, they well, they always chose to keep themselves out of harm and this is something we see throughout american history not in the case of saying always but in the case of saying almost always they choose to keep themselves out of harm instead of interceding and putting themselves at risk and at harm in order to 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 really show that they really believe in the things that they profess so and the last interesting point was just the brutality of it now, I know a lot of us watch Django and, and we think we understand brutality and we see some of the movies where they're pulling the slaves teeth out and we think we understand brutality. And I just want to say the brutality you see in those movies, the brutality you see in those 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 series. The brutality you read about in these books is on a whole other level. It's just on a it's a level of brutality that for as free and gory as television has become, it's still not at a level yet where it can really, truly and accurately describe and display what's happening in these books and in these narratives and in these people's lives. We're talking about and I'll say this one scene where a slave master wanted him to whoop a woman. Uh because he was light skinned and he wanted him to be a driver and a, a quote unquote overseer. A driver is the person that whips the slaves and drives the activities with the whip. So he wanted them to to have the he wanted him to be this person on his plantation and he asked him, Do you know how to how to whoop a slave? How to whip a slave? And he was like, No. And so he proceeded to teach him how to whip a slave by whipping a woman. And he gave her 200 lashes or 250 lashes. I can't remember which. Then he stopped and lectured him on technique and then gave her another 250. And then after he had beaten her to a bloody pulp, he had him rub her back down with salt brine. That 500 lashes in and of itself is a level of brutality that is unfathomable but then to rub salt into her wounds dear god i mean 
I'm getting choked up, like, just thinking about reading that passage. And that was just one scene of the brutality that was displayed, that, that he lived through. So, there are two big takeaways from this for me. And there are, there are multiple big takeaways, actually, but... I'm only going to talk about two. The first is the family dynamic, which again is something that is seldom touched on in movies, remakes of slave narratives, TV series. It's something that's seldom touched on. This man got free multiple times and returned multiple times to get his wife and child and got caught and returned to slavery multiple times. And this is something we just don't see. Even in the famous Root series, we saw slaves escaping and not coming back. I don't know that we've ever seen a slave narrative where a slave escaped and came back to get his wife and child, to get his family. I just don't know that we've ever seen that. I've never seen one. Some of the more popular narratives, like 12 Years a Slave, talk about somebody that was not born into slavery, that was illegally captured in their quest for freedom. Roots is a very general story, talk, and there are questions about roots. But, you know, even, even, the, even the birth of a nation, the story of Nat Turner, talks about, you know, one major attempt. So we've never seen a narrative where a slave has gotten free, returns, gets captured, gets free, returns, gets captured, gets free, returns, gets captured, gets free. We've just never seen that. And that illustrates, in my opinion, the strength of the family bond, the family ties, and the serious nature with which they took their marital, their marital oaths, even though by legal standards, by law, and by dominant white religion, their oaths were meaningless. They still took them that serious, and it shows the connectivity they had as a people. And there are other things that show that as well, but that is a major, major, major point of lesson here, something that I would love to harp on over and over and over, something that I do harp on over and over and over, because a lot of the times when we talk about black families and black homes nowadays we speak about them as if they're broken and as if they have been broken since slavery and even in the book even in my book the growing chasm i point out and i've been making this point for years now that's simply not true coming out of slavery our family units were strong So even despite being broken up and sold all over the place, they were still strong. So th that is a powerful takeaway. And I think it's something that we should all consider more seriously when we look at the damage that the post-slavery society did, had on us psychologically and culturally. We're talking about from the end of Reconstruction in, in the late 70s, early 80s, all the way up to about the 1950s and 60s. So, well, and actually we could go even further and go all the way up to the 1980s. So we could say that 100-year period from 1880 to, to, to 1980 and the destruction that had on us psychologically. So the second big point was the well-meaning white folks that weren't willing to put themselves at risk. And this shows itself Time and time again, and not just in this book, but in history, there was at one point where these guys had agreed that they were going to purchase, they had purchased him, and they had told him that they would help him reunite with his wife by purchasing his wife. And so they went back to the slave master that owned his wife, and they began to try to make a deal but the slave master was unwilling to sell because he was so fed up with henry bibb he didn't want to see him and he didn't want to do anything that could be viewed as helping him so 
while they're negotiating and the slave master pulls his gun on these white men who are there to try to help Henry Bibb get his wife back, his wife sees him and runs up and begins begging the slave master on hands and knees, sobbing, to sell her. And the slave master begins beating her as she's wailing. And Henry Bibb runs over and he begins begging the slave master as well to sell his wife to these men so they can be re reunited. And he begins beating both of them. And these white men who were there, well-meaning, rather than do anything physically to take this man down or even to get in between the lashes and the slaves, they stood there screaming condemnations at the man as he's beating this husband and wife. And that, from a historical point of view, has been the role of well-meaning white people. They scream, they yell, they shout condemnation. But when it's time to get their asses kicked, they're, I won't say all of them, not enough of them are willing to for us to reliably count on them as allies in any sort of capacity. And that was probably the most relevantly powerful lesson that could be got from any of these slave narratives. Yes, there are white people willing to stick their neck out, but it's in limited capacity and it's only so far as there won't be any major retribution or consequences for their actions. And that's what we're faced with. So just powerful stuff in this book. I definitely recommend you get it. It can be found for free audio as well as uh, the, 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 the text of the book on the PAX website, www.pactsinc.org. You can find that on the link to this post. But just powerful, powerful, powerful book. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. And that has been this week's episode of Lessons from the Screen. Looking at the narrative of Henry Bibb, an American slave, definitely go check that out. And I will see you next week on the next episode of Lessons from the Screen. Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they go do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trash, we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you from them Lessons, so sit back as we grew Giving you the review, so you only spend time on the docs that you need to Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in to Lessons from the Screen Lessons from the Screen is brought to you by Pax Inc. Through the Freedom Train Network, you can find us on www.freedomtrainradio.com or on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Stitcher. Be sure to head to one of those places and leave us a review, and then be sure to head back to the website to let us know what you think about the show and communicate with us. Also, be sure to head to www.packsync.org and show some love and support for our sponsors. Pack Sync is doing big things in the community and trying to do more, always trying to do more. So be sure to head to the website. That's www.pactsinc.org. Donate, volunteer, become a member, talk about it, whatever. They can use your support. And once again, they are doing great things in the community. And as always, Lessons from the Screen has a frame of reference and perspective that is aligned with that of the black community. The things that we look at whether it be on the Trending Tuesday or the regular Lessons from the Screen show, will always be looked at from the black perspective. So keep that in mind because we need more minds shaped into that perspective and trying to do things that we need done for ourselves. So with that in mind, again, thank you guys for listening in. Remember to tune in to the Freedom Train Radio. We have the app that's available that you can get from the website. It's in the Google Play Store. Sorry, it's not available on iTunes yet. We have the live internet radio, and we have more shows coming up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and I will see you guys on Thursday for the next episode of Lessons from the Screen.